One of the most important features of NMR spectroscopy are the effects of spin-spin coupling. We see evidence of this in almost every spectrum we collect. Protons split neighboring protons and this leads to the multiplets that we can use to help interpret 1D results. These couplings are also exploited in the 2D COSY experiment that allows you to map out the through-bond correlations between protons. Coupling is not limited to the homonuclear examples we have discussed so far in these videos. All NMR active nuclei can show through bond coupling between each other. Proton and other nuclei with a spin quantum number of one half behave very similar to the homonuclear examples. The most abundant isotope of carbon is carbon-12. It has a spin quantum number of zero, and is NMR silent. The carbon-13 isotope has a spin quantum number of one half and is NMR active. It is fairly common to measure C13 spectra, however the natural abundance of carbon-13 is only 1.1%. The spin-spin coupling between C13 and protons can be seen in the baseline of proton spectra. These are called C13 satellites since the intensity is weak and the peaks equally flank the major proton resonance. The main peak is due to protons attached to the carbon-12 nuclei. These satellites are actually doublets from the single bond coupling between the proton and the directly bonded C13 nucleus. The spacing of these doublets usually range from 120 to 170 Hz. Like homonuclear couplings, these heteronuclear couplings can be exploited to show through bond connectivity between the two chemical shifts. Because the coupling can be considered going in both directions, experiments collecting spectra with either C13 detection or proton detection can be used. The pulse sequences that collect the carbon-13 spectra are called direct detection experiments. The most common is the heteronuclear correlation, or HET core experiment. Like the COSY, this 2D experiment collects many spectra at different T1 increments to produce the 2D spectrum. C13 suffers from poor sensitivity due to the low natural abundance and lower NMR frequency than proton experiments. Therefore, the direct detection experiments with C13 can be very time-consuming. Similar correlations can be made with a class of experiments that collect data on the more sensitive proton nuclei. These are called indirectly detected experiments and have become the usual choice over the direct experiments. For the single bond heteronuclear correlations, there are two experiments that are commonly run. They utilize a slightly different approach but they yield spectra that provide the same information. These pulse sequences are heteronuclear single quantum correlation experiment, or HSQC, and the heteronuclear multiple quantum coherence experiment, or HMQC. HSQC is the experiment we recommend because the F1 line widths are usually smaller than with the HMQC. There is also an option for running edited experiments that differentiate carbons based on the number of attached protons. This helps with spectrum interpretation and we will see this later. The HMQC gives a little better sensitivity and is more robust with instrument calibration and instability, so it might be the better choice to run on older spectrometers. On the facility's instruments, most samples will not show a significant difference between the two experiments. Running an HSQC experiment in ICON NMR is similar to setting up the COSY experiment. Like the COSY, all of the HSQC options are composite experiments that will first run a proton spectrum and use that to optimize the chemical shift window. There are a few more choices and they are spread out among the experiment list. The initial group of experiments are near the top of the list. Note that the first two experiments that include HSQC in the name are actually HSQC TOXI experiments. We will cover these options in a later video but for now skip these to find the HSQC, ED, ET, GP, SI, SP underscore ADIA. And HSQC, ED, ET, GP, SI, SP experiments. Both of these experiments use adiabatic pulses for the 180 degree pulses on the C13 frequency. Normal or hard 180 degree pulses show significant loss of effectiveness on peaks further away from the center of the spectrum. This becomes a significant issue with carbon because of the large chemical shift dispersion. The problem gets worse as you go to higher field strengths. 
Adiabatic pulses use a frequency sweep and amplitude modulation to increase the effectiveness across the full range of the spectrum. These experiments are recommended for instruments above 500 MHz, but our lower field instruments will also benefit from the adiabatic pulses. We will compare the results from the adiabatic experiment with those from a sequence that uses hard 180 degree pulses. Lower down in the list we find two choices that both use simple 180 degree pulses. The first choice, HSQCGP is a phase sensitive experiment that uses gradients. The second choice HSQC, ED, ET, GP is an edited experiment. This is our recommended choice of experiment that does not use the adiabatic pulses. After we select this option, both the proton and HSQC experiments are entered in the ICON NMR row. The proton default parameters are OK for the 25 mg ibuprofen sample. Two scans on each increment for the HSQC experiment would be good for most samples with at least 15 mg of sample on any of the facility's instruments. The higher field instruments would be successful with less sample. We will fast forward through the running of both experiments, which takes about 20 minutes to complete, and return with reviewing the results in topspin. This is the proton spectrum of the ibuprofen sample. It shows a peak for the carboxylic acid proton at 10.7 ppm. The para-substituted aromatic benzene ring has two pairs of chemically equivalent protons that fall between 7.1 and 7.3 ppm. The aliphatic region shows five chemical shifts that is consistent with ibuprofen. Based on integration the isopropyl methyl protons are the doublet near 0.93 ppm and the other methyl is the doublet at 1.53 ppm. The heavily split isopropyl methine is the 9-line multiplet at 1.88 ppm. The doublet at 2.48 ppm, with the relative intensity of 2, is the methylene and the quartet at 3.74 ppm is the methine that is adjacent to the carboxylic acid. This is the HSQC result for the ibuprofen sample. The F2 axis that runs horizontally on the screen is the proton chemical shift. The F1 axis shows the C13 shift scale. The default range for the carbon chemical shifts are about minus 10 to 160 ppm. This range should contain most types of protonated carbons with the notable exception of aldehyde groups. See the staff for help if you require a different chemical shift window. If we increase the vertical scaling to bring up the base of the cross peaks we can see both T1 noise and the phase imperfections. Like one-dimensional spectra, phase-sensitive result peaks need to be adjusted to give correct shapes. In the contour plot, the blue color is from intensity that is positive, or extending out of the front of the screen. The green color is from negative intensity. Correctly phased results will not have the two colors running away from each other in either the F2 or F1 dimensions. During the automation processing, Topspin executes an auto-phasing operation with the APK2D command. Generally, this works well for datasets that behave ideally. However, we will see that this dataset suffers from issues that arise from choosing a sequence that uses the hard 180-degree pulses. These phase imperfections are mostly minor and the intensity can be lowered to mask the issue. Also, interpreting the results are usually not affected by slight mis-phasing. Correcting the phase of a two-dimensional experiment has a few more steps than what is needed for a simple 1D spectrum. To start the process, click on the phase tab. You then have to select at least two traces that include peaks. These peaks should be intense and far apart from each other in both the F2 and F1 dimension. Selecting a peak in the middle is also recommended. To select a peak, carefully move the crosshair cursor with the mouse onto a cross peak and click on the right mouse button. Choose Add from the pop-up menu. This will include the trace in both frequency dimensions for the phasing routine. Repeat these steps on the other peaks. When you have included all the peaks you want to view during the interactive phasing, you then can choose either the row or columns buttons from the window button bar. The R icon will choose the rows or F2 dimension. When you choose this option, the display changes to show the individual traces that were selected. They are arranged from top to bottom in the order that they were selected.
Note the red cursor that will automatically show on the strongest peak in the top trace as the pivot point for phasing. This pivot point carries down to all the included traces. The button bar now resembles the phasing routine for a 1D spectrum. Like for 1D results, move the mouse to the button with the zero icon and then click and hold the left mouse button. Corrections to the frequency independent or zeroth order phase can be made by moving the mouse up or down. Remember, during this step just focus your attention on the peak under the red cursor. After this peak is correctly phased, release the button and move the mouse cursor to the button with the one icon. Click and hold the left mouse button. Remember the first order phase is frequency dependent. Focus your attention on the bottom trace, which includes the peak furthest away from the pivot point defined by the red cursor. When you are finished with this adjustment, examine the top trace to confirm the peak under the pivot point is still correctly phased. Now examine the trace that is between the two extremes. As you can see, the peaks in this trace do not show the correct phase. No amount of effort can correct the phase across the full F2 dimension for this dataset. This is an artifact caused by pulse offset effects. As we will see a little later in the video, the results with the sequence that uses adiabatic pulses have this issue to a much less extent. Exit from this part of the phase routine by clicking on the save button. You could also discard the changes with the return button. The contour display should update with the phase change you made. The F1 dimension can be corrected next by clicking on the button with the C icon, which stands for columns. The traces now represent slices that run down through the contour display. Repeat the steps for adjusting the zeroth and first order phase. As you can see there is a small phase error with the middle trace. However, this is probably the best phasing that can be made on this dataset. Save the column correction and then exit the routine by clicking the return button. While the phase error looks significant when you greatly increase the intensity, there is little evidence of the issue when you scale back the peaks to just display the contours without any noise. Let's now focus our attention on information contained in the HSQC result. At the top is the 1D proton spectrum in the F2 projection area. This trace was loaded by the automation from the spectrum run before the 2D experiment was performed. The projection along the F1 axis is the true shadow projection from the HSQC data. Its resolution is limited by the number of T1 increments, which is 128 by default for this experiment. This comes out to more than 1 ppm per data point. If you have a 1 DC13 spectrum available, you can replace the projection with this dataset. Right-click in the projection area and choose external from the pop-up menu. Enter the file name and experiment number that contains the 1 DC13 spectrum and click on the OK button. This could make interpreting the results easier, but it is not necessary. We will focus our attention on the aliphatic region first. As stated earlier, the HSQC spectrum includes proton chemical shifts in the horizontal or F2 dimension and C13 shifts in the vertical or F1 dimension. Under each proton resonance you will find a cross peak at the chemical shift that the directly bonded carbon falls in its dimension. From this data we can confirm the chemical shifts of the carbons that are one bond away for the protons we assigned earlier. Let's look at each proton chemical shift separately. The isopropyl methyl at 0.93 ppm correlates with the carbon resonance at 22.41 ppm. The other methyl doublet is connected to the carbon at 18.10 ppm. Next is the isopropyl methine and it connects to the peak at 30.18 ppm. The next two protons attach to carbons with very similar chemical shifts. Expanding into this region we can see there is a slight difference in the two cross peaks vertical position. The methylene doublet at 2.48 ppm shows a correlation to the carbon at 45.06 ppm. Note that this cross peak is defined by green contour so it is opposite phase to the rest of the cross peaks. This is the important feature of the edited experiment and helps with assignments since the different multiplicities of the carbons can be distinguished based on the cross peak phase. All methylenes will show as cross peaks with opposite sign to methyls and methynes. Next is the methyne at 3.74 ppm that is connected to the carbon at 44.99 ppm. 
The two aromatic proton chemical shift show connections, with the peak at 7.14 ppm that is bound to the carbon at 129.41 ppm and the resonance at 7.26 ppm correlating to the carbon at 127.30 ppm. Note that you will only see correlations with protons that are attached to carbon. The peak for the carboxylic acid proton that is attached to an oxygen shows no correlation to carbon. The default plot layout in topspin is called 2D underscore INV dot XWP. This layout only includes the F2 projection. If you want the plot to include the 1D spectrum along the C13 axis, you have to change the layout to 2D underscore 2 pro 2 dot WXP in the open layout dialog. You can find this under the layout menu on the main control panel of the plot editor. Printing can then be done with the usual steps. This result is from the adiabatic pulse sequence. As you can see the automation processing gives a 2D spectrum with better phase than the previous experiment. We can fine tune the phasing as we did before, by first selecting the three traces. Then make the adjustments on the rows along F2. Note that the peaks in the center trace are now correctly phased. We then follow that by making adjustments for the columns in the F1 dimension. The center trace shows a much better correction than the experiment produced with the hard 180 degree pulses. The contours show very little phase error even with the intensity set very high. In multi-display mode this improvement in the phase behavior can easily be seen. The blue and green contours are from the adiabatic experiment and the red and pink cross peaks are from the non-adiabatic results. Because of this improved phase behavior, we strongly recommend the use of the adiabatic experiments when you run HSQC experiments on any of the facility's instruments. This concludes our video on running and interpreting the HSQC experiment. Combined with the COSI experiment, the HSQC is extremely helpful for interpreting NMR results. With good samples they can be performed in a fraction of the time needed for a 1D carbon spectrum and provide more information. The downside is that HSQC does not provide any information on carbons that do not have attached protons. In the next video we will look at the experiment that gives multiple bond correlations and together with the HSQC, most molecules can be completely assigned. Please see the staff if you have any questions about running the experiments or on interpreting the results. Thanks for watching.